Six, psychotherapy, how to cure modern suffering. Previously, I discussed Freud and Jung who focused on the unconscious. While Freud took an individualistic approach to the person's own unconscious developed in their own lifetime, Jung took a more collective approach to the unconscious developed in our lifetime but also inherited from thousands of years of evolutionary wiring. While both Freud and Jung try to explain the unconscious mind, in this segment I'll talk about a few approaches to psychotherapy or how to solve psychological problems or how to cure the suffering of the mind. Three distinct approaches emerge in how to cure modern psychological illness. Gestalt psychotherapy took a more masculine approach by emphasizing rationality, therefore putting the responsibility on each individual to grow up and take accountability. In other words, it's better to be cruel than to be kind. Humanistic psychotherapy, on the other hand, took a more softer feminine approach by emphasizing human needs for fulfillment in a lonely and disconnected world. A third approach called existential psychotherapy, which emerged from literature and storytelling, emphasized life's purpose and meaning as an antidote to modern suffering. Before I explain different schools of psychotherapy, I should give you a brief philosophical context. One of the most fundamental questions that has puzzled philosophers and psychologists has been the problem of perception. How do we know reality? How do we get knowledge of the world? So before we can cure modern suffering, we ought to know what causes this suffering. So perception is at the heart of suffering. For thousands of years, philosophers believed that knowledge is innate in us, most likely given by God or gods. However, in the 17th and 18th centuries, two opposing philosophical approaches emerged in Europe. On the one hand, rationalism argues we have an innate knowledge of the world. It is given to us at birth. The outside world just helps us or triggers us to unfold this innate knowledge. Why innate? Well, it's God-given, or you could say it's in your DNA. The British philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume didn't buy this rationalist explanation. Instead, they argued that our knowledge comes from outside. As babies, we know nothing. As we grow up, we learn things through our senses and slowly we build a more sophisticated understanding of the world and ourselves. So rationalists think knowledge is innate and empiricists think knowledge comes from our experiences with the outside world. Then the German philosopher Immanuel Kant came to bring these two schools together. He argued that neither rationalism nor empiricism has the full answer. The real answer is somewhere in the middle. First, Kant argued that we can never fully know the world, so our knowledge is always partial, biased, and limited. Why? Because we are not sponges that absorbs everything, rather we are extremely picky and selective in our understanding of the world. Our knowledge of the world comes from outside, but we are not passive. Rather, we are extremely selective in receiving the knowledge. He argued that we humans, in fact, impose our own structure to the world. So our knowledge comes to us, organized, categorized, and easy to understand. How do we do it? He said we have an innate mental structure that we impose onto the outside world. However, despite Kant's reconciliation of empiricism and rationalism, science in general favored empiricism and it was more evidence-based. The empirical approach broke things down into smaller parts so we can analyze them separately. This approach gave science the ability to study matter in its smaller parts like atoms, cells, particles, and so forth. So in Germany in 1880s, when Wundt opened his lab at the University of Leipzig, he was a scientist, and naturally he explained the psyche through empirical experiments. He studied the mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller parts. Thus, his psychology is termed as a structuralist approach, which is very much an empiricist approach to the human psyche. So structuralism and psychology saw the human mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller parts and each part can be studied separately. Wundt, for example, studied humans' reaction to certain triggers and thus divided human consciousness into three parts, representation, willingness, and feeling. The next generation of German-speaking psychologists responded to structuralism by arguing that it is a mistake to look at the mind as a structure. 
one of the first psychological approaches that questioned structuralism was Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology, we are rational, responsible individuals. Gestalt in German means form or pattern. So instead of looking at the mind as a structure that can be broken down into smaller components, like one studies living organisms as atoms or cells, Gestalt psychology looks at the mind as a whole. Therefore, it's a holistic approach much closer to Kant's rationalist philosophy as well as Plato's idealism. But who are Gestalt psychologists? Fritz Perls, who lived between 1893 and 1970, a German-born psychologist, agreed with Kant that we see reality through a human lens or a funnel. Therefore, our perception of reality is not the entire reality, but a limited perspective of reality. For example, when we see, smell, hear, or touch something, we only get a partial understanding of what that thing really is. As Kant said, we can never fully know the real world as it is, but only know the phenomenal world as we see and experience it. So Fritz Perls, alongside his wife, Laura Perls, focused on the perception itself, not the object of perception. According to structuralism, you can study consciousness through the, its reaction to the outside world events. You can trigger someone through sounds, lights, as William Wundt carried out his experiments. Pearls, however, argued that perception cannot be broken down. Our knowledge of reality is highly subjective depending on factors such as proximity, similarity, prior exposure, connection between objects, and change. As a result, studying perception or consciousness should not be based on some unified or rigid structure that can be fully understood. Instead, it's very much changeable and we each have a somewhat control on how we perceive things. In other words, we are responsible for how we see the world. We cannot hide behind the blind will or unconscious mind controlling us. At the end of the day, we are free to see the world. I should also point out that Fritz Perls was of Jewish descent, therefore he lived when Nazism took over Germany and had to flee. At the time, many Germans saw no problem with Nazism and later some people blamed their actions on following orders. Today, a lot of people blame society or the system for their behaviors or mistakes. So Fritz Perls wanted accountability for our actions. Perls also had an issue with psychoanalysis, which argued that most of our behaviors were the result of the unconscious mind. This means we cannot be held responsible for a lot of what we do because we do them unconsciously. But putting the blame squarely on the unconscious mind also had another danger. It meant that patients had to be rescued for the unconscious hell. Who could rescue them? Of course, psychotherapists. These gave the psychotherapists an immense power over their patients. So Fred's Pearls wanted autonomy and responsibility, which became the foundation of Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology emphasizes personal autonomy and control over our perception, actions, and emotions. For example, you are capable to learn how to understand the world, either follow others or carve a path for yourself. You are also responsible for your actions. Not only that, you are also responsible for how you feel. In other words, nobody can make you feel angry, only you can. If something doesn't go your way, you have a choice, either find a solution or get angry or cry about it. You can't blame the world for how you feel. To understand Pearl's idea, it's helpful to compare it to the Buddhist doctrine of conscious living in now and here, and the impermanence of things. We are responsible to be aware of ourselves and the world, but also aware that everything is constantly changing, just as your feelings are changing. So it's your job to be aware of an ever-changing world. Gestalt is a very individualistic approach that gives the individual full autonomy and responsibility, so one cannot blame the world, the unconscious, fate, or anything. You can only blame yourself. Nobody can victimize you but yourself. Everything is a choice. Gestalt psychology is a very masculine approach to life, which Guy Carnot, who was born in 1951, further emphasized the role of a strong masculine father as a role model for strong, robust children. 
the absence of a strong father leads to soft children. This idea is beautifully depicted in one of the most profound Russian novels written in 1859. Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov is about the laziest character in literature who refuses to get out of bed for his entire adult life. Now, interestingly, his friend is the total opposite, a disciplined, responsible, hard-working man. Why is that? The lazy man has a Russian father while his hard-working friend has a German father. Goncharov, of course, pokes fun at Russian society compared to how hard-working the Germans are. So Gestalt psychology emerged from that German psyche of hard work and responsibility. Gestalt psychology had a huge influence in the field of empowering the individuals. You make or break your own fate. Nobody can help you if you cannot help yourself. Some criticize it for being a bit cold and less cozy for not relying on others. Being in the presence of people who take care of you can also be extremely important for one's mental well-being, which according to Gestalt might make you too soft. So to sum up, Pearls pioneered Gestalt psychology by arguing that how we perceive reality is far more important than the reality itself. It's not what you see, but rather how you see. Is your cup half empty or half full? Do you take responsibility or do you blame others? He also emphasized that individuals take responsibility for their thoughts, actions, and feelings. Nobody can force you to think, act, or feel the way you do except yourself. Reason meets emotions. While Gestalt psychology takes a very rational approach to human psychology, therefore it neglects the human emotions that often overpower our rational thought. It's all good and well to be rational all the time, but when we get emotional, which we often do, rationality is thrown out of the window and we throw a tantrum like babies. So how do we rationally explain and understand and tame emotions? This task of reconciling rationality with emotion fell to the American psychologist Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis, who was born in 1913 and died in 2007, developed a psychological theory that is somewhat similar to Gestalt, arguing that experiences do not cause emotional reaction in us, but our belief system does. His theory is called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. He argued that our irrational thoughts cause us emotional issues. We often call some people overthinkers, anxious, or neurotic. If two people lose their jobs, an overthinker who suffers from irrational beliefs may find it a lot harder to deal with it, while the rational thinker might look for a solution by simply trying to find another job. Or one blames other for his misfortune, while the other may blame themselves or nobody instead focuses on finding the answer. Ellis says, The best years of your life are the ones in which you decide your problems are your own. You realize that you control your own destiny. Rational thinkers accept reality and try to find new ways to adapt to it, rather than wishing reality was different. So how we emotionally respond to a difficult experience has a lot to do with ourselves, our belief system, and less so with the outside world. If someone jumps in the queue in front of you, you have a choice how you react. Get angry, simply accept, or calmly tell the person. The irrational response would be anger. The rational response would be either acceptance or tell the person to move back if there is no danger in doing so. So how we think, for the most part, affects how we feel. Religious ascetics are often very humble. They rarely get angry or emotional. Why? Because they are very strong in their beliefs. They have a firm anchor that nothing can sway them. So our belief has a lot to do with how we feel when faced at problems of life. The idea that your belief can impact your behavior can be seen through what's called the placebo effect. When patients are given medication and they get better, perhaps because they believe that the medicine would cure them. Dr. Bruce Lipton, in his 2005 book titled The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter and Miracles, goes so far as to claim that our beliefs impact our DNA rather than the other way around. The science of epigenetics suggests that our beliefs have influence over our genes, especially in the protein culture. 
As I discussed earlier while talking about Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconsciousness, that our beliefs are closely tied to our stories. The better stories we can tell ourselves, the stronger our core beliefs become. There is also a claim that certain diseases are more prevalent in certain cultures due to their cultural beliefs. The mainstream science, however, holds that we inherit most of our biology from our DNA. Ellis also observed that irrational thoughts tend to be black and white, fixed and absolute, while rational thoughts tend to change depending on the environment. So to sum up, Ellis argued that our emotional reactions to an external event is tied to our irrational beliefs which holds us back. While Gestalt psychology and psychotherapy emphasize rationality and accountability, which is a very masculine and mature approach, for some psychologists, reason alone couldn't solve our modern suffering. No matter how rational we are, our anxiety and suffering can only be cured through fulfillment and meaning. So here come humanistic psychotherapy and existential psychotherapy. Humanistic psychology, social justice, and love. While Gestalt and rational emotive psychology focused on the rationalistic side of the human psyche, i.e. individualism as it promoted autonomy and responsibility, some psychologists on the left felt this was a bit too individual-centered, even selfish in essence. And also this was very Western, but there was also a more Eastern philosophy-influenced approach that focused more on fulfillment and self-actualization. So this new psychological approach took a more humanistic approach, which was more communitarian and less individualistic, less rigidly rational but more humane and softer approach that saw life as a spiritual journey of fulfillment. One of the earliest humanistic psychologists was Eric Fromm, who united Marxist social justice with Freudian unconscious mind. Fromm was born in 1900 and died in 1980, he was a German psychologist who combined Marx's philosophy with Freud's psychoanalysis to develop what is called humanistic psychology. Karl Marx, influenced by European humanism, developed a socialist philosophy in which inequality was seen as the root cause of human pain. Freud, influenced by Hindu philosophy, thought that most of our life's suffering is caused not by economic inequality, but by the unconscious. Fromm agreed with both that life for the most part is full of physical pain and emotional suffering. Why? Fromm took a communitarian approach and argued that our suffering is caused by our separation anxiety. As humans, we first became separate from nature when we developed rational thoughts. We saw ourselves to be different from other animals. This made the human species the loneliest species on the planet because we were the only species who had this sophisticated language, culture, and built empires that ran for generations all thanks to our ability to have rational thoughts. So to cope with the anxiety caused by our separation from nature, we relied on our families, tribes, communities, and religions. And of course God. However, with the arrival of modernity, those communal bonds slowly crumbled. So modernity caused our second separation anxiety. Modernity gave us a lot of choices, as well as freedom from religion, dogma, tradition, and even family. However, this freedom, instead of making us happy, caused us more loneliness. Just as Soren Kierkegaard said, our anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. So what's the answer? Fromm offers love as the best antidote to suffering. Just like the Persian Sufi poet Rumi, love is the only path that unites us with others. The theme of love as the greatest antidote to suffering is also present in the works of the Russian novelist Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky saw love as the only way we can truly be fulfilled. Rumi's love is more mystical and divine, Dostoevsky's love is more orthodox Christian, as well as the simplicity of life seen through the eyes of the Russian peasants. Fromm's love is different. It's not the love of someone or something, but it is a creative capacity to encompass the whole world. In other words, through love, we reconnect with nature as well as other people through creative freedom. A good example is art and artistic creativity. 
Creative artists capture people's imagination through their art. Why? Because they cultivate the capacity to reunite with nature. Just like Nietzsche, Fromm saw art as an avenue to see the world in new, interesting ways. While many artists lack the ability to love or be loved by those around them, yet they cultivate a greater capacity to create art that is loved by many people. So to sum up, Fromm saw modern anxiety caused by our separation from nature and community. As a result, the antidote to suffering is return to nature through creative endeavors that have love at its heart. Another psychologist who took a humanistic approach was the American psychologist Carl Rogers. While Fromm placed suffering in our separation anxiety offered love as an antidote, Rogers argued we suffer because we are too rigid in our views, so we ought to be more flexible to change. Carl Rogers, who was born in 1902 and died in 1987, saw mental illnesses or mental health not as something static that was fixed, but as a process that was ongoing. In other words, not a stationary being, but more dynamically moving or becoming like a shifting target. As Nietzsche said, we are not human beings, but human becomings, as we go through changes and transformation throughout our lives. Rogers says, quote, What I'll be in the next moment and what I'll do grows out of the moment and cannot be predicted. For Rogers, even our personalities develop through our daily experiences. It may seem solid, but it's never solidified. In fact, he argues that a good life is only achieved through our openness to new experiences, ideas, and emotions, as well as accepting to trust ourselves. It's only in rigidity that we develop mental illnesses because we either bury hatred, resentment inside or show them on the outside. Rigidity makes it difficult for us to accept reality as it is. Instead, we want the reality to conform to our wishes. This causes frustration, anxiety. And if challenged enough, it causes mental illness. He also demanded that we take responsibility for our lives. This accountability also makes our lives easier as we know what to do instead of blaming the world. You cannot change the world, but you can certainly change yourself. One can see the influence of Eastern philosophy in Rogers' psychology. In Eastern philosophy, instead of changing the world or environment, the responsibility is put on the individual to change themselves to adapt better in any environment. This humanistic and person-centered approach was taken up by another famous American psychologist, Abraham Maslow, who was also influenced by the Indian philosophy of self-actualization and fulfillment in life. Abraham Maslow, who was born in 1908 and died in 1970, whose hierarchy of needs is a well-known list of human motivation and the process of self-actualization. Maslow was interested to know how we find meaning and fulfillment in life. What motivates us to wake up every morning, go to work and repeat the same until we retire or die. Maslow understood that humans achieve different states of consciousness depending on their needs. He divided into two main sections and each of those into separate four parts. The first section he called deficiency needs. As a living organism, our basic needs are air, food, water, sleep, warmth, and exercise. But we also need to be safe, be in the company of others, and get recognition from others. So our basic needs are mere survival. The second section he called growth needs, which includes cognitive, aesthetics, self-actualization, and finally self-transcendence. In other words, we need to know the world, appreciate its beauty, showcase our personal potential, and finally become greater than ourselves by helping others. This is somewhat similar to the Eastern philosophy of achieving a higher level of consciousness that gives you fulfillment. Of course, in Hinduism and Buddhism, nirvana is the escape from the cycle of birth and rebirth, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs is achievable in this world. So both Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow took a humanistic approach in which meaning and fulfillment were at the forefront of human existence. 
while Gestalt focused on individual responsibility, therefore more outcome-driven and success-based, humanistic psychology, however, took a softer approach, influenced by Eastern philosophy in which one must feel fulfilled. This humanistic approach also hinted at another approach which is called existentialist psychology. Existentialist psychology Existentialism in philosophy came about after the death of God. It has its origin in literature in which the characters or heroes are thrown into difficult situations in order for them to struggle and come out triumphant. As a philosophy, existentialism argues that we are born first and then we can define who we are. According to Jean-Paul Sartre, perhaps the most influential existentialist philosopher, existence precedes essence, which means we have no essence at birth, and as we grow and mature, we are able to define ourselves. No God has given us a purpose in life. It's up to each individual to define a purpose for himself and herself. And psychology, existential psychotherapy, is very similar to humanistic psychotherapy in that both emphasizes free will and self-actualization. It's up to each individual to find a purpose in life. While humanistic psychotherapy tries to alleviate suffering, existential psychotherapy says we can cope with suffering if we have meaning for our lives. Two of the most famous existential psychologists were Viktor Frankl and Rollo May. Viktor Frankl, born in 1905, died in 97, was a German psychologist whose three years of horrific experience in the Nazi concentration camp had a lasting impact on him. He developed an existential psychotherapy in which meaning was the most important element in someone's life. His famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, published in 1946, details two important human qualities that endure hardship decision-making capacity, and freedom. He argued that if someone has a solid meaning for their life, they can endure any hardship. In other words, if you have a solid story for your life, you can overcome any challenge. A story gives you purpose and therefore it anchors you. He treated patients who are suffering from grief by trying to find meaning for their suffering. He says, quote, Suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. But how do you find meaning? Frankl argued that meaning is not created but discovered. We discover through work, through creativity, and through loving others. Rollo May, who was born in 1909 and died in 1994, was another existential psychologist who wrote an influential book, the Meaning of Anxiety in 1950, in which he drew upon philosophers such as Soren Kierkegaard, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Martin Heidegger to argue that instead of categorizing life's experiences as good or bad, we should follow the Buddhist view that all human experiences should be accepted equally. Why? Because once we accept all experiences as equally important in our lives, we open the door to growth. Everything we do during the day are significant in the overall story. Just as every brick is important in holding a building stable, so is every little thing we do. Once we recognize that all of our actions are important, we also accept that negative feelings are as important as positive ones in our lives. So to conclude this segment, in psychotherapy two distinct approaches emerged. Gestalt has a distinctly Western individualistic approach, while humanistic existential has an Eastern flavor. Gestalt emphasized rationality, while humanistic and existential psychotherapy emphasized meaning. Gestalt psychology grew in response to structuralism and psychoanalysis, to put the responsibility on the individual rather than the outside events or the internal unconscious. Fritz Perls demanded that individuals take accountability for their thoughts, actions, and emotions. Albert Ellis echoed this in his rational emotive psychology in which he emphasized that our irrational beliefs often cause us emotional suffering and even physical pain. Instead, we should react to outside events rationally. Eric Fromm developed what is termed humanistic psychotherapy in which he argued that our anxiety is because of our separation from nature and other people. 
So he emphasized we developed our creative capacity for love that can reconnect us with nature as well as other people. Carl Rogers also took a humanistic approach to mental illness, not as something static, but rather changeable and impermanent, just like the Buddhist notion of the world. Rogers emphasized openness to new ideas, experiences, and feelings, also living in the here and now. Maslow further developed the humanistic psychology in terms of human needs in his famous hierarchy of needs chart, in which a human journeys through life from meeting his own survival needs to achieving transcendence by helping others. And finally, Viktor Frankl and Rollo May developed existential psychotherapy arguing that meaning allows us to cope with life's suffering. Instead of avoiding suffering, we come to terms with it once we understand the meaning behind it. Of course, the two world wars devastated Europe, so people felt lost, so these psychologists tried to find answers. Gestalt, which takes a more Western rational individualistic approach, asks people to take responsibility for their actions and not blame others. Humanistic psychology took a more communitarian approach that focused more on the meaning and fulfillment and less on productivity and success. And finally, existential psychotherapy argues that if you have meaning, you can cope with any suffering or challenges life throws at you. However, computers were invented during the Second World War in order to break into the German intelligence. So in the next segment, I'll talk about cognitive psychology, in which the mind meets the computer. Unlike behaviorism and psychoanalysis, cognitive psychology tried to explain human perception, memory, and the power of intelligence. Yes, we are conditioned by our environment, and yes, we are prisoners of our unconscious mind, but despite all these limitations, we are also capable of becoming more intelligent and more aware. In other words, the mind is not a hindrance, but one of the most sophisticated computational machines out there.